How you doing? I'm good. I'm really excited yeah. to be here. Why are you excited? Because I'm a huge fan of your show. Yeah. And I just went and visited the set and I took oh, did you? like a trillion pictures. I'm the biggest fan. Yeah? Yeah. Well, we'll have to take a picture on the set afterwards. <gasps> That would be my dream. You know, turn the lights on and everything. Really? So, do you watch the show? Yeah, every day. Yeah. Joe will tell you when I'm doing my makeup, when I wake up in the morning, basically any time I have spare, I watch the show. So, what do you like about the show? Why? Why do you? What do you get out of it? Are you like a mental health advocate? Do you like that kind of stuff, I or do. do you look for train wrecks? I mean, what is it? I think uh, both. <laughs> I yeah. look for train wrecks, and I'm really interested in mental health. Yeah. Since I was like really young. We've had a whole mental health thing in my family. And so it's just really interesting to me. But what I like about your show is how you don't sugarcoat anything and you always say it as it is and you do it for the benefit of the person that you're talking to. And I think that's really important. You say that it's been an issue in your family. Was it like in your immediate family or is this a generational thing? Uh, it's not a generational thing as far as I know. I mean, yeah. I'll find out later that my mom has something crazy or something, but no, it's my immediate family and myself as well. Yeah. Um, mental health problems. And so it's been something that's just been of the utmost importance in the past like five years in my life. And so I'm really interested in it. So what's been your biggest challenge mental health wise? Oof. Um, there's been a few things, but I think the biggest challenge and I've had it for the for the longest out of all my <laughs> mental health problems is my depression. I've suffered with depression for about five or six years now and the biggest challenge is just for me getting out of bed and getting out of the house. Yeah. And like learning to love yourself is, is the biggest challenge I yeah. think. Now you're 22 right? Yeah. And so when you say like the last five years did you not have any issues with it until you were like 17? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, I, I really don't think I had any issues with it up until I was, yeah, around 17. And yeah. then it all of a sudden just kind of hit me. <laughs> Is there anything that caused it that you can think of? I mean, because that's interesting to me. Because you, you're 10, 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. I had a really happy childhood. I think... <clears throat> It was a combination of, I think, social media on the rise at that time. And also my friends were all going to university and I, w I wasn't going to university, I was working, but I was still living at my parents' house. And so there was like, I felt very alone and I didn't have, and my brothers were away at university as well. And so I, um, I think that was mainly it. Yeah. Uh, a combination of the two. So you have two brothers. Two brothers. Are they older or younger? Older. Yeah. How much older? Um, nine years and seven years. Oh, older. so a lot older. Yeah, a lot older. Oh, okay. So were you like a mistake or was this? I don't know. I've always asked my mom if I was a mistake and she, I don't think she really tells <clears throat> me the truth. She doesn't want you to know? <laughs> I don't think she wants me to know. But you may not have been planned. I might not have been planned. No, I yeah. don't think I was. Does that bother you? No, that doesn't bother me. Yeah, because my boys are seven years apart. Really? Yeah. Is Jordan the younger one? Yes. Was he planned? Let me tell you how planned he was. <laughs> After I had Jay, I had a vasectomy. What? Yeah. So... I don't tell people this, but I'm telling you because we're friends. Yeah. Uh, no, after Jay, I had a vasectomy because I can't believe I'm telling this. Robin, she wanted to have a baby. I didn't really want it at the time. Yeah. And so after we had the one, I had a vasectomy. And then I did this kind of life skills seminar thing that I did sometimes. And she was there. And there were like 300 people there. We're in this big ballroom. I purposely stayed away from her. Yeah. She's totally across the ballroom. But the ceiling was dome, like a parabolic reflector where you can whisper in one side and, and hear, it, and hear the it the other, yeah. other side. It was a time where they were talking about any regrets they had. And I hear her whisper, I'm sorry to have one child. No way. And I'm like a hundred yards away. No way. And I hear that whisper in my ear. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> because to me... Just having one was like on a scale of one to ten, it was a two. 
And to her, it was like a 10. Right. So the next day, I'm at the hospital making rounds. And the guy that delivered Jay is a good friend of ours. And I'm telling him this because he had been through this thing I did. Yeah. I I tell him when it happened and what happened. And he said, well, you know, we could reverse that. And about that time, his brother-in-law comes around a corner who's a urological surgeon. Oh, my God. He comes around the corner and he tells him about it. He says, well, um, we could say he's going into the operating room for a vasectomy. And because that's just day surgery, we could just sneak him in there. So they take me in and do microsurgery under a microscope and put everything back together. That's crazy. They have there to, and then they did it? Right then. What? So I call her, just to be sure, I call her on the phone and I say, I totally make up a story. So what are you doing? So I'm at the hospital and there's this woman and her husband's like thinking about, do they want to have a baby or not? And, and she said, don't you try to talk her out of it. No way. And I was just testing to see how strong she felt. She said, don't you try to talk her out of having another baby. Oh, my God. I said, so oh, my God. Knew. So I hung <laughs> up. Fuck. And they smuggled me into the <laughs> surgery room saying I'm going to get a vasectomy. They do it. And the next thing I know, it's 6 o'clock at night, and they're waking me up saying, you have got to walk out of here. We're all going to get busted. you oh got to walk God. out of here. So they drive me to my house, to the curb. They put me out of the car. They put a pink baby gift under one arm, a blue baby gift under the other arm, honk the horn and drive off. No. And left me standing there. <laughs> she had no idea. And she comes out and says, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm still under anesthesia. These are my friends. They just leave me standing there. And so I walk up and say, I just had my vasectomy reversed. And she just burst into tears. Aww. They said there was a 50-50 chance within the next two years. Eight weeks later, she's pregnant Eight with Jordan. Eight weeks? The McGraw boys are swimmers. Yeah, they really are. Eight weeks Some later, she's genes. pregnant with Jordan. <laughs> that's so amazing. So that's my story. Wow. So was he planned? Damn right he was planned. Damn right I mean, he was we, planned. We worked on this. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So that, those seven years apart, and that's why. Wow. So I love Jordan, by the way. Yeah. Well, thank you. He's a, he's a, he's an interesting kid. Yeah. He's becoming a good friend of mine and Joe's. Yeah. He's really fun. Yeah. He's a fun. He's very talented and a fun kid. I'm really proud of him. Yeah. So he thinks the world of you, by the way. Thanks. So, <laughs> so your brothers are seven and nine years older. Yeah. I don't know how we got off on that. Why am I telling that story? It's a good story. Yeah. That We've is. Got a lot of ratings on that one. Yeah, I guess. So you're at home alone. But by now, you're 17, so how many years have you been on Game of Thrones by now? Uh, four years. So you're four years on Game of Thrones. Yeah. Before you start getting depressed. Yeah. Okay. Was it hard the first four years? Was that tough shooting? Um, no. I mean, it was like long hours and things like that, but I was so in love with it. Everything was just like, I, I couldn't believe that I was going to get paid for it. I was like, oh my God, I get paid for it as well? Like, I'm on an amazing show. Everything <clears throat> was incredible, and it, it only started to kind of go downhill, I think, when I started to hit puberty, and really puberty, though, at like 17, and my metabolism was like slowing down massively, and I was gaining weight, and then there was the social media scrutiny and everything, and that was when it kind of hit me. Did social media cause you to get depressed? I think um, I think it contributed. I wouldn't say that was the main reason. I think it's a, you know some sort of chemical imbalance, but um, I think it definitely was a bit of a catalyst. Are you what I call SMS, social media sensitive? Yeah. Were you then? Are you now? I think I was more so then. I'm learning to not be so much now. Yeah. But yeah, like you see. 10 great comments and you ignore them but one negative comment and it just like throws you off what would people say that bothered you what kind of thing would bother you so the character that i play on my show is called sansa and people used to write like oh damn sansa gained 10 pounds or sansa needs to lose 10 pounds or sansa got fat <laughs> really <laughs> yeah it was just a lot of weight comments um or i would have like spotty skin because i was a teenager and that's normal, and, and I used to get a lot of comments about my skin and 
my weight and how I wasn't a good actress and things like that. I used to get called wooden a lot. Still do. <laughs> and that and that bothered you. Yeah. And what would you say to yourself about that? I would just believe it. I would just say, yeah, I am spotty. I am fat. I, I, I am a bad actress, and I just believed it. So you would go to work the next day. How would that affect you when you went to do your scenes the next day? Well, I'd get them to tighten my corset a lot. I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> make it tighter, make you got it a tighter. Foot in your back, pulling. Yeah, like pulling. <laughs> Um, I, I just got very, very self-conscious. Um, I would try out different things with my acting. I actually wasn't angry about the fact that people said I was wooden because it, it kind of inspired me to try new methods of acting and things like that. So I wasn't that mad about that, but I would be concerned about angles. I'd be concerned about my face. I had big nose and everyone used to love to tell me that. And so I would be like, I don't know how to angle myself and it would just affect me creatively. And I couldn't be true to the character because I was so worried about Sophie. Right. And do you think it caused you to do a worse job or a better job? I think a worse job. Really? Yeah, I think so. Did you tell people that it was bothering you? Did you tell your director or anybody no. that it was bothering you? No, I'm so passive. I'll let anyone do anything and let them do whatever angle they want. But I have a friend, Maisie, who was on the show with me and she's just a year younger than me and she and I were growing up together and she was my best friend and so she was the only one that I really told about all of it. So how many weeks or months a year would you shoot? Uh, months total it would be like a seven month shoot out of a year. Yeah but there'd be breaks in between? Yeah. Yeah and when there were breaks would you stay inside stay in your room stay in bed? Oh yeah. Yeah, I would, as Maisie and I used to do it together. We were, <laughs> I think, being friends with each other was quite destructive because we were going through the same thing. And so we used to get home from set, go to a Tesco's across the road, like a little supermarket, and just buy food and go back to our room and just eat it in bed. And we never socialized for about, for a couple of years. Really? Yeah. We didn't socialize yeah. with anyone but ourselves. Yeah. And when you say depressed... How did that express for you, just by being withdrawn? Yeah, withdrawn. Um, I had no motivation to do anything or go out or even with my best friends. I wouldn't want to see them. I wouldn't want to go out and eat with them. I would cry and cry and cry over just getting changed and having to put on clothes and be like, I can't do this. I can't go outside. I can't. Mm -hmm. I have nothing that I want to do. Yeah. And it never occurred to you that 99.999999% percent of the girls in the world would love to be you? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. I guess the grass is always greener on the other side. I think I, I was in like a really special position um, and I count myself as very lucky for that, but I don't think I viewed myself as worthy of anything that I was doing. How did you explain all of your success? I mean, here you're on the arguably the most successful series or one of the two or three, maybe The Sopranos, maybe Friends, I don't know. I, certainly on the short list of the most successful series in the history of television. Right. And you are a anchor role in that series. Yeah. Out of millions <laughs> of actresses. It's you. How do you explain that to yourself? Just blind, should house lucky? I think I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I got lucky because my audition was really bad for the show. So I have no idea why they cast me. Lucky, probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And then it was also lucky that they kept that character in that role for seven years. How do you explain that? Well... Because they, they kill everybody. <laughs> they do kill everybody, it's true. But they didn't kill you. They didn't kill me, but um, I guess I was still alive in the book, so they had to... I don't know, I'm just making excuses. Well, I'm just wondering what your know. internal dialogue was, wh how you explained it to yourself. Because you said, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't deserve it, I wasn't... But, so uh, how did you explain that you were there? I don't know how I explained it. I was there, but like I am now, like I would just keep making excuses. Like the character is, has a really long storyline in the book. So I thought, well, they've got to keep her on because it affects 
the way that other characters interact with her and re- interact with each other. And I'd signed a six year deal <laughs> so they couldn't mm. really kill me off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you have support? I mean, did your parents support you? Did, I yeah. mean, did they come and say, don't be depressed? Did they get you help? Did they? Um, well, I didn't <clears> really, I didn't tell my parents until um, less than a year ago and they started seeing my <laughs> therapist bills coming through. And uh, that's when I told them. Yeah. So they didn't notice that you hadn't been out of your room in three months? Uh, no, because as soon as I hit 18, I moved to London. Right. Out of their house. And so yeah. um, then I could do everything on my own. And then you did? You, you would stay isolated? Yeah. 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 So how do you feel now? I feel much better. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I've been doing therapy. At cast centers, actually. Yeah. (laughs) I'm on medication. And I I love myself now. Or more than I I used to, I think. I don't think I love myself at all. But I'm I'm now with someone that makes me realize, you know, that I do have some redeeming qualities, I suppose. And when someone tells you they love you every day, it makes you really think about why that is. And I think it makes you love yourself a bit more. So, yeah, Mm -hmm. I love myself. So, I love myself. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You said that like you meant it. Mm. Do you still read social media? I try not to. No, um, I mean occasionally little things, but I don't. I don't let people tag me in photos on Instagram, and uh, or if they do, I can't see it. Um, and I try not to read comments on my pictures either, or on Twitter. But um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I have a cheat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you read something negative, does it bother you? Yeah, it does. It still does. It's still very sensitive for me, um, yeah. but not so much, not as much as it used to be, yeah. because I don't believe those things anymore about myself. Yeah. You know those pe- you don't know those people, right? Mm, yeah, I, mean, I don't you know. You realize them. you don't know anything about them. Yeah. I don't know anything about them. And they don't know you. No. And they wouldn't say that to you in an elevator. No, they wouldn't. If you were in an elevator with them, they wouldn't turn and say, hey, no, she gained eight pounds. <laughs> no, I guess not. I hope not. No, I mean, really, they're keyboard bullies. Yeah. Yeah, they're hiding behind their computers. Yeah. They yeah. wouldn't say that to you. They wouldn't even speak to you. They'd no. They'd probably wet their pants. <laughs> if they got in the elevator and looked over and saw you, they'd pee their pants. I've always wanted to, like find the people who wrote those comments and go around to their houses and be like, hey, say it to my face. Yeah. But I don't know if they would. They wouldn't. Well, let's go find one of them and see. <gasps> Shall we? I would yeah. love that. <laughs> yeah, just go. Hello, me again. <laughs> so what do you say to yourself now about yourself? Um. I mean, do you have an internal dialogue that you listen to? I don't know what I say to myself, I think. Really? Yeah. You really don't know what you say to yourself? No. I don't know. I, I think really? like if I I do little things to help myself out, like if I if I look in a mirror, like I, I don't body check and things like that. And when I put on clothes I don't put them on in front of a mirror. Um and then I just walk out the door, like that helps me. And now I look in mirrors and I think like I, I'm fine and I'm not fat or I don't have spots and Trying to see the bigger picture rather than the little things that Mm -hmm. you kind of hone in on about yourself. So do you have a best friend? I do. Yeah. I have a couple. Girls or boys? Girls. Uh Uh-huh. Girls. And my brothers are also my best friends. But Yeah. So what do you like best about your girlfriend? She's very independent. She's funny. She's outgoing. She's unapologetically herself. When she was like 15, she used to wear dungarees every day to school. And even a teacher used to be like, why would you wear dungarees to school? Do you guys call them dungarees here? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, sometimes. Um, It would be like, why do you wear dungarees to school? And she would be like, because I like them. And I used to love her for that. Um, And she still wears dungarees to this day, even to work. And so she's unapologetically herself and she's funny and she's really smart and... um, She's just in her own lane. That's interesting to me. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, you said independent, funny, unapologetically herself, and smart. 
you didn't mention one thing about her skin, her weight, her body, anything. You didn't mention one thing about the things you obsess about yourself. You said she was independent, funny, unapologetically herself, and smart. I so you don't so. care about those things about no. other people. No, I don't. And so actually someone, my therapist actually said to me once, because I was telling her I'm so obsessed with all these tiny things, and she went, you don't matter enough for people to look at you and go, I don't like this about her or like her boobs or her arms or things like that. People don't care about it. People don't care about what you look like. And that really affected me. I was like, you're right. I'm, I'm so absorbed with myself that I don't even realize that that people don't look at the aesthetics, they look at who you are, but I was so absorbed with this and this. Yeah, my dad used to have a saying, and uh, he said, you wouldn't worry so much about what people thought of you if you knew how seldom they did. <laughs> I love that. That's a good quote. Yeah, it is. That's you, one to live by, actually. You wouldn't worry about so much about what people thought of you if you knew how seldom they did. <laughs> And it's the same way with bullies. Somebody might say something to you in the cafeteria at school, in the eighth grade, or on social media, and they might say it to you one time, but you take over for them mm. and repeat it yeah. a million times. They say it once, and you repeat it a million times. Yeah. That's why I ask you what you said to yourself, because we talk at 125 words a minute, and we think at 12 to 1400 words a minute. So somebody can say something at this speed yeah. and then you think it at more than 10 times wow. that speed. So you can repeat it thousands of times a day. That's amazing, I didn't know that. You think at 12 to 1400 words a minute. Damn. Somebody can say, you know, she looks fat. You can repeat that thousands of times an mm. hour. Yeah, and that is what I used to do all the time constantly you can also repeat yeah, I'm a worthy person I have value I'm caring I'm smart I'm giving I'm you can repeat those things thousands of times an hour too I'll try to do that instead. that's why I said what do, you, <laughs> what do you say to yourself I was just curious what your internal dialogue was well it's still you know <clears throat> still struggling a little bit but I'm working on it I'm getting better so yeah. hopefully I don't know by next year I'll be yeah I'll be thinking that all the time. So what do you do for fun? Um, well, that's another thing. I'm learning what my hobbies are nowadays because that was yeah. something that I stripped away from myself for years because I would just do nothing and work. Um, so I'm really enjoying reading up on psychology and um, I want to study criminology. I want to do an online course, I think. And I like <clears throat> art. I can't paint, but I like doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm a terrible drawer so I like doing that I like going to art museums I'm trying to get back into ballet um, little things like that I'm working on it so do you do things outside do you like to go out do you yeah, jog well, do you play sports do you do anything like that uh, honestly <coughs> I've been taking like a six month break from working out and it's been amazing yeah. <laughs> um, but I like boxing I, I live in New York now so I, I walk around all the time because it's the only way to get anywhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I do like being outside very much. Yeah. So you're so interested in psychology. Are you, Have you thought about doing things in the field of psychology, like volunteering on helplines and crisis lines and stuff like that? I would love to do that. Because I, that's something that you could really have an impact in. They don't even have to know who you are because you're just a voice on the other just, end of the phone. Yeah, I would love to do that. I would love to do that. <clears throat> and I also, I want to do something to do with mental health in the UK because I think I told you this before, and you already know this, <laughs> but there's not nearly enough mental health facilities, good mental health facilities in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so people who struggle, I know people who have um, been suicidal out there and tried to find help and, and there just isn't there just isn't enough quality help out there. And I've had to get them over to America <laughs> to get the help that they need. And so I want to do something out in the UK as well. Have you ever lost anyone to suicide? Nearly. 
twice. Really? Somebody close? And what saved them? What pulled them back? Um, well, not, not enough drugs in their system. Quite enough. Um, and therapy in, at car centers. But they them. just failed? I mean, they failed twice. They just they tried and just didn't get it. Yeah, done. some someone found them the first time and got them to a hospital quick enough so that they didn't bleed to death. And and um, the second time, I guess, not enough drugs in the system. When you were depressed, did that ever seem like a good option? Yeah, yeah, it did. I used to. It's weird. I I say that I wasn't depressed very much when I was younger, but I used to think about suicide a lot when I was younger. Even when you weren't depressed? Yeah. Really? I don't know why, though. Maybe it's just like a weird fascination I used to have. But, yeah, I used to think about it. I don't think I ever would have gone through with it. I don't know. When, when you say that you, you're psychologically minded, what's your, what's your theory? What's your position on psychology? Do you have a philosophy? Uh, no, I need to learn more <laughs> to have a philosophy, but I'm just really passionate about about it, especially as like an actor as well. I think it only informs your acting, um, but I'm not doing it to inform my acting. I'm just fascinated in the study of why people are the way they are, why people are depressed, why people schizophrenic, why, like all, all of those kind of things. I'm just really interested in it and I want to know everything. Well, I've been fascinated since I was 12 years old with why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's in sports or just life or whatever. Just think about what an edge you have in life if you understand that. Why people do what they do mm. and don't do what they don't do. Yeah. Because... What people don't do is as important as what they do. Yeah. Failing to take action, failing to seize opportunities, seize moments, whatever is as important as the choices they make. Yeah. But I, I try to get people to understand life's about choices, and what they don't get is you cannot not choose mm. because not choosing is a choice. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you're doing, if you say, do I want to go or do I want to stay? Do I want to go here or go there or go there or go there or just sit here? That's your fifth choice. You cannot not choose. You always make a choice. Yeah. You make a choice about what you say next. You make a choice about what you do next. Even if it's just to sit there, that's a choice. Everything in your life is a choice. And I just think you should be who you are on purpose. Yeah. Why be in this world by accident? Be who you are on purpose. I, I'm who I am on purpose. I do what I do every day on purpose. Yeah. I don't do it passively. I do it on purpose. And that's what psychology is about for me. Just be who you are on purpose. I love that. I need to learn how to do that more because I'm a very passive person. So I'm going to try and be who I am on purpose. Why do you well. think you're passive? I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know, but everyone would agree with me. Everyone always tells me. Really? Yeah, my therapist tells me all the time that you're so passive. What's your payoff for being passive? Not much. Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> well, I suppose I'm a people pleaser. And yeah. so I am passive so that other people can <clears throat> make the choices that they want to make and, and I can kind of go along with that and do do what I can to please them and... You please people because you think if you don't make waves, they'll let you stay around? Um, yeah. <laughs> or they, or they'll, I'm so scared of being judged. Um, yeah. And so even on set, if, if I don't, if, you know, if I see a scene a different way to the way that we're doing it, I won't say anything. Yeah. And that doesn't make a very good actor, but I, I, I get so scared to say something. I don't want to say something and people look at me like I'm an idiot or... Yeah, that, if you require something, they may not let you stay stay around. Yeah. Oh, she's okay. Now, you, it was okay as long as you did what we wanted you to do. Yeah. But if you're going to start requiring something, get out. You get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. Okay, so that's your payoff. Yeah. Is I, I don't 
I don't have any pressure of of having to be accepted if I make a demand. Yeah. So your payoff is comfort zone, just safety. Exactly. Okay. And, and people always say curious. to me like, "Oh, you're very you're you're so easy to work with." And I'm like, "Yeah, no shit, cuz I never say anything." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But have you ever tested that out that maybe if you said what you wanted to say and actually, "Hey, they actually let me stay." I kind of tested it out about 6 months ago and it worked out well for me, but it was a very minor thing. Um <clears throat> It was really minor, but I'm, I have a problem with speaking out, I think, and it, it was just on set. They were trying to sit me under, there was a ton of scaffolding and kind of like this, but like this massive light that had been kind of swinging around on the set, and they sat me right under it. And um, my friend who was on the movie with me, she was quite a mentor to me, and she came up to me and she was like, you know you don't have to sit there. You should probably move. And so I got up the courage and I was like, I don't think I should sit under here because it looks quite dangerous. And they were like, yeah, you should move. And it was that easy, but I was so in my head about it the whole time and been working myself up to just, I don't think I should sit here. And it worked. I felt pretty proud of myself. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> People only do what they get a payoff for. Yeah. If you wonder why you do what you do, look and see what your payoffs are. Mm. Anything you do in pattern, you get a payoff for. Yeah. So if you're passive, you got to say, what's my payoff? Find the payoff because you're getting a payoff somewhere. Yeah. And if it's safety, I mean, maybe that's your payoff. I guess it is then. How do you do in your relationship? Um, good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good. Um, you mean being passive? Are you passive in your relationship? Um... What do you think, Jay? Am I passive? No. No, he's shaking his head no. He's shaking his head no. Yeah. I'm comfortable around you. Yeah. Yeah. But you feel safe around him, right? I feel safe around him, yeah. Very yeah. safe. I won't be judged by him. He's seen the worst. You've seen the worst and it was horrible, wasn't it, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> he just had to bear up. I have a great book for you to read. Oh, really? It's the book that's had the biggest impact on me out of any book I've read in psychology. Oh, wow. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Thanks. No, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Oh, wow. Have you ever heard of it? No. It's written in two halves. The rest of the title is An Introduction to Logotherapy. Don't okay. read the half. Won't read that. About Introduction to Logotherapy. But the other half which is just about his philosophy and experience is the single most profound thing I've ever read really? in psychology. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian psychiatrist. He was a prisoner at Auschwitz. Oh, wow. And he talks about his experience at Auschwitz. And... He says they controlled everything, mm. whether you live or die, mm. whether you sit or stand, whether mm. you eat or don't, just virtually everything except one. He said they cannot control the attitude you take about it. Yeah. He said they can control physically everything I do, but they can't control what I say to myself about it. And what he said to himself about it was that he had to survive and he had to find some reason that he endured all of this. Because if he didn't find meaning to the suffering, that he would go insane. Yeah. You, you have to find some reason that you endured this, essentially so it became tuition instead of penalty. Yeah. Because if you get something out of it, then it was a lesson. You just paid tuition, even yeah. though that was ridiculously high. Mm. And if not, if you just suffered it for no reason, no purpose, no gain. Wow. And so every time you go through something, you said you spent five years being depressed. If you don't find or create meaning or purpose out of that, 
what's the point of having endured it? Mm. Yeah. But if you if you use that in some way and create value out of it, someone like you that is an absolute icon to your generation <laughs> that is transparent about mental health issues can save thousands of lives by being transparent about that. Yeah. Young girls can look at you and say, oh my God, I admire her so much and if she can have those issues and come out the other end, I'll never give up. Yeah. Because I, I look at her and if she can do it, I can do it. I'll, I'll be inspired by her. I will do it. She did it. I'll do it. Your transparency, just what you've said today, I guarantee you what you've said today can save a thousand lives in America this year. Well, wow, that's something that I would love. I kid you not. It will save a thousand lives in America this year. That is absolutely what I hope to be like the payoff for me going through all of that. That's something that to make movies about it or to just speak about it and be transparent about it. That's that's the payoff that I would like is for people to not feel so alone and, and feel encouraged to talk to someone about it and and hopefully save them from something you have to break that down and translate it think about think about what i just said think about you you watch the show so much and so you know about how many girls eighth or ninth grade parents go in their room and find that they've hung themselves in their closet because they've been bullied on social media yeah think about that and think about how many girls may not do that because of what you've said. How many parents will open that door and their girl will be sitting on their bed because of what you've said? <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. That would be the truth. And... When we post this up, we're going to put the numbers for suicide hotline and, you know, the helplines and all. Yeah. I mean. That's how powerful what you're doing can be. That's what I call creating meaning to suffering. I mean, if that happens, my God, I'll just talk about it all the time. <laughs> well, I'm I'm serious. That's how powerful. You know, when you rise to the level of achievement, notoriety, fame, and admiration that you have, and then you use that to draw attention to something you're passionate about, it it changes the world. Yeah. Frankly, we can go get the lady that cleans up after we're gone. She can say that, and she is just a valuable human being as you are. Yeah. But because nobody knows her, they won't pay attention to what she says. They will pay attention to what you say. I'm not saying that's the way it should be. I'm just saying it's the way it is. Yeah. And when you're willing to break the facade and not be Miss Perfect Billboard Glam Actress... <laughs> and be real, then people will say, oh my God, I don't have to hide this anymore. Mm. Because the number one thing that people do that are depressed is they withdraw. Yeah. And then they become inactive. Mm -hmm. Psychomotor retardation, they pull back and they stop doing. And then they see you and they say, why am I hiding this? Yeah. Sophie's not hiding it, why should I hide it? Yeah. And she talked to Dr. Phil about it. She talked about these hotlines, these support groups, this help. She's seeing a therapist. Why am I acting like it's something to be ashamed of? I admire her more than anybody I've ever seen. Why? And she's not ashamed of it. Why should I be? Yeah. And that's the thing. People Bang. shouldn't be ashamed of it. It's, it's 
so many people are, are kind of plagued with depression or anxiety or, or body issues. So many people, more people than people re realize. And so if people just spoke about it, if people just like opened up to their friends even, or their family, it would be okay. And pe other people suffer with it too. And, and all you do is you just have to speak to someone and you can get the help that you need. And, and you can like with therapy or, or if it really comes down to it, like medication, you can, you can change it. Like you can change that thing about yourself. And people just need to know that it's okay to talk about it. Yeah, and, and you know, that's the thing. If you just, you just said it, give it a voice. Yeah. You it's don't have to do it alone right now. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. No. If you hate your body, you know, I'm not into labels, but if you've got body dysmorphia or you just think you're ugly or you got acne or you're depressed or you have panic disorder or whatever it is, the biggest problem is people think they're the only one that's that way yeah and they don't talk to anybody and if you go tell your friend and they go oh my god me too yeah yeah then you go oh. you know like you said Maisie you guys used to talk I mean you shared some bond with things right yeah yeah and misery loves company but <laughs> if you reach out to somebody that can help and whether it's a counselor or a pastor or your family physician or your mother or your father or your brother or a friend, somebody, then, you know, hopefully there'll be somebody that will say, let me, let me help you. And sometimes yeah. it just takes somebody listening. It, sometimes it's very cathartic to just talk about it, right? Oh, completely. The best thing I ever did was just talk about it. Yeah. Even now I'm getting therapy. <laughs> yeah. It feels good to vent it, right? Yeah, it does. It's the think, best thing in the world because you yeah. keep it so locked up. Yeah. And it completely destroys you yeah. from the inside. And and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. I mean, we're all hydraulics. we got all this stuff going on inside. And if we give it a voice, it's like monsters live in the dark. Yeah. And when you turn the light on, and you turn the light on by talking about it, and you yeah. go, oh, well. It's not so scary anymore. That's not so scary. Yeah. I mean, I said it, and he didn't run away. I know. <laughs> I yeah. mean, Joe's over there. He didn't run away. Freedom didn't run away. <laughs> Laverne didn't run away. Because everybody has felt that. Yeah. At some way. In some way. You know, hell, I've I've had down days. I've, you know, everybody has it. And sometimes it gets into pattern and, you know, turns into something yeah exactly and then you have to do something about it yeah so and, and there's no reason that you shouldn't no it's like a broken arm you go and you you yeah. get the help that you need and, and there you should be it. no stigma there shouldn't be any stigma there should be no stigma whatsoever i got in a twitter fight with someone the other day <laughs> because <laughs> they were saying oh my god that, um <laughs> i love twitter fights <laughs> because they were saying that um celebrities uh it seems to be quite the trend now celebrities coming coming out and talking about um depression and and just mental health problems that they have i got in a huge fight with him because i thought what an asshole how can you say something like that it's like how many people in the world have broken their legs and if every single person talks about like oh i broke my leg i broke my leg once i i struggle because my leg's still broken if everyone got together and talked about it, you'd be like, that's a bit of a trend, isn't it? But really, it's just because everyone struggles with this, or nearly everyone. And it's the same with mental health. And and people talking about it isn't a trend. It's just people actually being transparent for the first time. And people like that should realize that like <coughs> mental health problems are everywhere in ev almost, almost every person that we know. And... Um, I just think it's so important to talk about it, and I hate that guy. But, you know, if he had a half a brain, what he would be saying is, thank all of the people that can draw attention to this for drawing attention to it. Yeah. Instead of criticizing, because thank everybody that does it. I know, because I thought, you know, you have, he has sons. 
And I thought, God, ima imagine if your son is going through something right now and you're shunning these people back into silence on Twitter. Um, and he has a platform and I was just like, what if your son sees that and then doesn't feel like he can come out to his own father and say, I'm yeah. struggling through this. Yeah. How long did this Twitter fight go on? Mm, just like it, he went off longer than I did. He just kept going on and on and on about it, and I mean, I'd uh, said my piece. How just long did you spend on that? Um, how long did I spend on it? Like a whole day of, cons right? Forty-eight hours of yeah. boiling over. Yeah. Well, I asked because that's forty-eight hours of your life you can't get back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste your time on those idiots. I know. <laughs> it's so true. You're right. But, you know, Oprah said something once that I thought really stuck with me. We were in her office, and I think E.T. or something was on. It was showing some red carpet. And, you know, she's probably the biggest celebrity ever. And she said, you know, I never feel like they look that's interesting. I never feel like they look. Because everybody looks so glamorous I know. and like everybody's so party and fun. Yeah. She says, I never feel like they look. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. Because that's an image, right? That's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever feels like they look. No, never. That's Think all the smoke truth. and mirrors. Yeah. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all Photoshop or like huge designer dresses and things like that. And it's just not real. And it's not, yeah. it's just a fantasy that no one can live up to. Yeah. And so once you get that through your head and stop trying and stop comparing your body to some fiction yeah, and start getting real, then all of a sudden you start focusing on independent, funny, unapologetically yourself and smart and you don't care whether she's in 6, 8, 10, 12 or 14 jeans. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Or dungarees <laughs> as you call them. I mean here's a question that I ask my boys all the time. Do you take time sometimes like on set or whatever to take a deep breath and look around and take it all in and go, wow, what, um, a, what a trip. I have, but I only did it really once on the, f I think it was my final day of working on the show of Game of Thrones. And it was the one day that I really like appreciated being there for the, for in so long since I was like 13 I walked onto the set in my costume and I looked around and I was like this is the last time I will ever feel like this and be here and oh my god isn't it amazing what what everyone has done on this show so I, I did it once but I want to do it more yeah but I think only when things come to an end do you really start to appreciate them no well not my relationship I guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> I still appreciate you and we're not coming to an end, so. No, but that's, the reason I ask is because you, you don't want to do it at the end. You want to do it along the way. I know. It's my biggest regret is not doing it along the way. Yeah, that's why I'm bringing it up, so you'll do it along the way now. I will. Uh, because really it's, and I do it, I mean, I'm 17 years into, 17 seasons into Dr. Phil, and I still occasionally I open that door and the red lights flashing and everybody's scurrying around and it's a surreal world. Yeah. I realize I come here every day and there's 350 people here all dedicated to getting me on that stage at that time to do what I do. Yeah. And I think what a gig. I've got this unique ability all my life of getting these gigs where somebody does all the work and I get all the credit I just look around sometimes and go wow because you you, you forget that most of the world never gets to see all of this and yeah. see all of it happen and you're in the biggest shows biggest movies biggest everything there is and you're 22 
Yeah. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it is quite amazing. Yeah. And it would be terrible if you didn't take time to enjoy, enjoy it. I know. I while should. it's happening. I know. I should. I should have done that with Game of Thrones years ago. Yeah. But I'm going to do it with everything everything else from now on, I think. You promise? Promise. Yeah. So what's next for you? <sighs> what's next? Um, well, <clears throat> I actually am still on my break. I took a break off of work to focus on my mental health because <laughs> I thought it was important. So I'm still on that, and I'm just about to go into press for the final season of Game of Thrones. And um, uh, a movie, Dark Phoenix, that I did, the latest X-Men, is coming out in June. So I'm getting ready for a big press tour for that. Right. And tell me about that movie. What's your power? Uh, well, she kind of has unlimited powers. Oh, yeah? <laughs> she, her main powers are uh, uh, telepathy and telekinesis. Um, but... Uh, she kind of inherits this uh, this power that's otherworldly, and she has the power to do anything she wants. And um, and so she's not just telepathic and telekinetic anymore. She's everything. She's the most powerful mutant in the world. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you like that movie? Do you like your character? Did you have fun doing it? I had a great time doing it. It was yeah. the most challenging thing I've ever done. I think. Really. Likewise. Yeah. Well, why? What made it challenging? Um. It was just an abundance of um, traumatic scenes <laughs> and emotionally draining scenes. And um, and actually, we, we kind of tried to find links between um, the things that she was going through and to ground it. We, we tried to find links between her fantastical things that are going on in her head and schizophrenia and dissociative identity disorder and things like that so um it was a lot of preparation and and it was a lot of work but it was really fun yeah what do you hope to do next um i don't know at the moment i i want to do a lot of things and not just in the film world i want to i really at the moment i have real urge to go to the police academy and just become a cop yeah. I would really like to do that. What's your fascination with that? Um, I'm fascinated with crime. And again, like psychology and why people do things and the interrogation process and, and how you can manipulate your words and, and the pauses you have in order to get someone to confess or, or to, to make them feel like you know something about them that you don't already know. That's something that really interests me, mm -hmm. interrogations. <laughs> Boy, have I got have I got a couple of books for you to read? Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, you're you're gonna love this. Oh, I want to know. I've spent a lot of my career uh, working in and developing techniques for deception detection. Oh, I know. You, you always uh, foil people on the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's two different things. There's one thing spotting a lie. Okay. That's one thing, which is actually very easy to do and most of what's in the media is a myth about spotting a lie right like not like the look left if no, you look to the left that's crap <laughs> okay but there are things that are very reliable on deception detection that's one thing but then another thing is getting to the truth right it's one thing to know they're lying it's another thing to get to the truth right so they're two separate things, and I think you will really find it fascinating. Wow, I would love to read to that. To understand how to how to how to get um, how to interrogate, and it is not what people think. Really, it is not what wow. people think. I would love to find out about that. Have you detected anything on me? <laughs> I think you've been very open. I have been. <laughs> you, I, I think you've been very, very open, and I, I don't think you've, um, I, I, I don't think you've hidden anything that I've asked you about. No. So, is there anything you want to talk about that you haven't talked about? Um, 
I don't think so. I think I've spilled my guts. <laughs> <laughs> Too much or just right? No, just right. Yeah? Yeah. Well, you're sitting here with Dr. Phil, and you can ask anything you want to ask. Oh, my God. <laughs> I have so many things I want to ask. <laughs> um. Other than I can find this out anyway, who the craziest person on your show has ever been. But um, what? Oh, my God. There's so many things, Dr. Phil, that I want to ask you. What's been the most rewarding thing that you've ever done in your career? I think it's giving a voice to people that don't have it. Yeah. Um, which is particularly children. Because when... I see kids that are caught in the middle or kids that are being abused mm. or neglected and they don't have the power to change it uh, or women that are caught in domestic violence. I mean, I've had situations where there are women that I'm sitting there with the woman and her partner or significant other and... I can see her shaking because she is afraid to say anything in front of him. Yeah. Because she knows if she does, the minute they leave here, uh, he may Hot beat her. the crap out of her yeah. or whatever. Um, being able to intercede and get her safely out of that situation or get children out of that situation uh, that's the most rewarding thing of all is to give people a voice that don't have one give them an exit ramp that they wouldn't ordinarily have mm. that's amazing because you're a uh, I don't know what the term is but you you're like a reporter you can report if kids are in a bad situation right yeah, I'm a mandated reporter mandated reporter so yeah. if I see it I either have to fix it or give them a plan or report it within 24 hours. Right. I got to do one or the other. And is and that the same for like women or people people in domestic? Yeah. Domestic if, if there's somebody in that, that you see in danger, yeah, then you, you have to do it. Ah, okay. And we do. Oh I'm, yeah, I know. I mean, we 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 call and turn them in. That's amazing. Because I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to let them stay another night in a situation like that. And I, I can't go home and, and knowing that some kid is going back into a dangerous situation. Yeah. Not and I love that you do that even with stories that I'm just fangirling, but like on your show, when people come in and they have their kind of story, um, and, it's not about the kid. It's not about a, a child in any way. And then you immediately see that there's a problem in another department. And you get that child out of that situation, even though they weren't even brought up in the conversation. And I think that's Well, it's, it's really astounding amazing. to me that people will come in and their kids are in such harm's way or in such chaos. And... I'm halfway through the show, and they've not said, neither one of them has said, what can I do to help this situation? Yeah. They're just assassinating the character of their partner. Neither one of them have said, tell me something I can do to improve this situation. Yeah. I, I think what they do on the show is a microcosm of what they do in the real world. Mm. So I see, well, yeah. this is what's happening at home. Yeah. Like the... Um the kind of um, the woman whose parents were worried about her because she was living with that man who thought he was like the the new coming of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the kid and the the kid was on the side of the road asking for money. Yeah. With the mother, it's crazy. Yeah. Put him out panhandling. Yeah. Who does that? I know it's insane. Who does that? Who loses their way that much mm. that they put their kid out there? Yeah. But. That's when you go home and feel like, I did a good thing today. Yeah. That's when it's a good tired. 
I think that's why I love watching your show because I always think at the end of it, I'm like, good old Dr. Phil, he's done it again. <laughs> he's done it again. <laughs> well, I've got good books for you to read if you'll read them. I will. I've got a fun one for you to read too. Oh, really? It's called 400 Things Cops Know. Oh my God, I love it already. You'll love that. <laughs> okay. It's fun stuff, like they tell you what the kill zone is. Oh, wow. It's where you never park. Really? Yeah, like when you go to a domestic. Wow, that's so interesting. It's like you never park. They say this is the kill zone. If somebody's going to get shot, it's going to be in this zone right here. Wow. Never park in the kill zone. That's amazing. 400 things cops know. Okay, done. And, uh, and And one of them is, who's your best friend? You think it's your partner. They say, nope. It's that shotgun bolted in the middle of your car. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, I love Hell that. with your partner. So you have shotgun bolted in your car. <laughs> These veteran cops have written down to 400 things cops know. That's really funny. I like that. Yeah, it's a good book. I'll, I'll give you that and the other ones on interrogation. Oh, my God. Yeah, you'll love these. I'll get them to you today. Today, Thanks. I'll send them over. <laughs> Sophie, thanks for doing this. Thank you so much. I really much. appreciate it. I appreciate it more. All right. <laughs> All right. Don't come in. Well done. That was amazing. Great, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah.